last time it was a disaster, wasn't it? I was yeah, kind of... because you were slightly behind. <laughs> I was me, in, I was out, I was you just were like... my background. Yeah, it didn't work out very well. Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Neil Almond. Good to be back. Shannon Doherty. Ditto. And Christopher Such. Hello again. And this week, the focus is going to be on well being. But first, Chris, what are you reading for? Hey, what are you reading for? Uh, recently, I've been reading a really fantastic book. Well, I'm only halfway through. Maybe the second half is terrible, but the first half suggests otherwise, uh, called How Children Learn Language by William O'Grady. I've read a few bits and pieces and watched a few kind of YouTube series about early language development, um, which is, is it an inherently fascinating subject. But this book tackles it in a really wonderful manner it's got that lovely mixture of being academic but accessible it's constantly dropping in these lovely little examples of the ways that uh, kids learn vocabulary the way that they over generalize um, when they are learning syntax it's yeah it's delightful little read as i say accessible and entertaining and given that spoken language is the foundation of literacy and that early development of spoken language is the foundation of that. Um, I can't see any better reason to read a book than that. So yeah, check that one out. What about you, Neil? What are you reading for? So I was reading something that I came across uh, relatively recently. It's quite a recent article. Um, if people have been following uh, Emily Hanford's podcast, Sold Story, uh, you'll understand where this is kind of coming from. And this is a chat called Kevin Butler and He's very transparent in that he's purely just making a hypothesis here, but the three queuing um, could be an actual cause uh, for dyslexia. Now, I'm not too sure how much I buy the theory, um, but he's really transparent at it. You know, um, it is purely hypothetical. Uh, he kind of bases a, a large part of this basis is a because three queuing teaches children what dyslexia children tend to do anyway, which is just kind of use contextual information to try and um, decode the words. And from there as well, through I think through some uh, MRI scans, he kind of notices that um, the parts of the brain that um, are working when dyslexia, when dyslexic children are trying to read uh, are the same parts of the brain from children who've had some three queuing. And so he's kind of, I think, making a bit of a leap uh, to say that this is then a cause of dyslexia. But I think given that um, I've found the paper um, I think the day of or the day after um, Emily Hanford's series uh, just finished. Uh, so I found it quite interesting coming off the, the back of all of that. Kieran, what are you reading for? So mine is actually inspired by your Sunday Five, Neil. And it's a paper called When Problem Solving Followed by Instruction Works, Colon, Evidence for Productive Failure. And it's a paper from what, October 2021. And, you know... Fairly typically, you know, I'll be thinking instruction first is probably the way to go. And then to hear an alternative viewpoint described in such interesting terms um, definitely made me think. And so I think it's well worth checking out. I mean, what did you think of it, Neil? Yeah, I found it really interesting. I think it was just quite um, interesting how it really mirrored kind of the conversations that you were having with um, Gareth on the latest uh, problem solving thing. So I was glad I found it yeah um I've gotten to a really bad but interesting habit um where I will just spend an hour before I go to bed just on Google Scholar and I'll just think of a term and I'll then just like uh I will then filter it just by research from like the last like year or two so it's kind of quite a weirdly addicting thing to look at <laughs> uh, just because you know it's all finding good finding um you know old like seminal papers but you know you want to see what's you know happening recently in the field and that's how I find quite a few of these uh, papers that I then kind of do my best to 
synthesize in a in a tweet on a Sunday morning. Yeah, they're awesome. I, I like to search by 2022, 2021 as well. And then it, you, you have to do a custom race, don't you? Yeah, I think um, I found, was it the Colin Foster one on curriculum where they talked about them um, curriculum design? Um, uh, and then there was that one I used on my what you're reading for a while ago about um, oh, was a growth mindset and problem solving or something along those lines. And I thought it was an interesting paper. Um, yeah. But yeah, the 2022 search is a, is a fun game to play, though I don't spend <laughs> the last hour before bed <laughs> well I know. it's a really bad habit to have what i've kind of really enjoyed as well is going to seminal papers click on the citations and then filtering by 21 22 just to see if anyone recently is like taken a paper from like 1975 and said no actually it's all it's all tosh um, <laughs> tends not to happen there which is actually how i found that um instruction paper nice that's the next level searching right there <laughs> Oh, we're 101 episodes old, guys. We're we're old now. Um, it's good to be good to be back, Chris. I haven't seen you for a, a little while. Um, so, but I'm really looking forward to talking about well-being. I think we need to establish what we mean, as always. Um, so, Shannon, what do we mean by well-being? I think uh, well-being means uh, being kind of comfortable, safe, happy, healthy. Um, I think it relates to your kind of self-value, your sense of purpose. I do, you know, obviously in the context of this podcast, we're probably talking about well-being at work, but obviously well-being at home and our kind of general well-being is affected by our work as we spend so many hours there. So I think it is just feeling like comfortable and safe, healthy and happy. Those are my words. And excellent words they are. Thank you. (laughs) I'd chuck in a slightly more pessimistic view, which is <laughs> someone said to me at school, what does well-being look like? For me, it's any situation where I'm not constantly Googling, what can I do if I leave teaching? If I'm not, when I was in the classroom, any period of time, sometimes it was years, but any period of time where I wasn't doing that, my well-being was, in terms of like my job, was pretty good. So Maybe I can't define well-being particularly well, but I can kind of notice a red flag for when well-being goes wrong. Um, I agree with the idea of a sense of purpose. I think also another red flag, you know, that idea of Sunday dread that people talk about. Now, it's natural that all of us on a Sunday night are a bit, uh, when we're going back into the classroom. But when that gets intense, when that gets overwhelming, that's when it starts to think, when, when you start to think that, you know, your well-being is obviously being significantly affected by the job. However kind of subjective this term is, I think that's a, a pretty decent red flag for when things aren't quite the way they should be. Straight back in answering questions no one asked, Chris. Um, I'm not sure that what counts as a functional <laughs> definition of well-being, <laughs> not Googling how to leave teaching. <laughs> I imagine the Sunday dread is a factor of many a job and I think it would be silly yeah. of us to kind of say that only teachers experience that because I'm sure there are as stressful and if not more stressful roles in society um, I would just kind of think for well-being <clears throat> the only bit I'd add to that coming from a school culture side of that as this kind of idea of like psychological safety and it's kind of just idea that teachers need to feel comfortable if leaders are putting them in a situation where they feel their well-being uh, is at risk and having that kind of openness where SLT leaders will actually sit down and listen to those concerns rather than just uh, putting them off and just Mm -hmm. saying, oh, it's someone complaining for no reason. So I think for me, yes, you need to be aware of all these things that can kind of impact that well-being but I think the main thing the main part for me is actually then are you do you find yourself in an environment where these concerns could actually be taken quite seriously mm. I think actually Shannon summed it up there, there are a variety of ways to positively talk about well-being in terms of free time a sense of self a sense of safety a sense of self-efficacy and a sense of purpose and there are also red flags that perhaps we could look out for in the profession. Nice. So with, with that in mind, and I think things are tough across the profession and in most walks of life in general at the moment, 
what helps you maintain your own well-being? I don't know if I'm going to throw it to you, Neil, first this time. I don't know if I'm a good example because I remember doing a talk quite early on um, where I just kind of openly said, like, education is my hobby. So the way I kind of, my well-being is Googling research from like the last two years on a Google Scholar and like things like that, going to research heads. Um, so I really am not exactly the poster boy of how one should, uh, you know, relax and take a bit of time off work. Because the way I kind of do that is um, by doing more work, just because I find it interesting. Yeah. And I, when I say more work, things to do with education, not like a few of these things that I read, they will very kind of rarely benefit my day-to-day -day job. Um, but it's just things that I'm um, interested in. Um, I suppose one thing that I am pretty good at is emails. I'm, I can quite happily not answer an email. If someone really, really wants something, I know that they'll either call me or they'll send a second email. Mm. So I can kind of do things like little things like that, which means I can just kind of be in a little bit more control of um, what I'm doing, the way I try to organize um, my days and my weeks are kind of through something called like the Eisenhower matrix, where you kind of have things that are um, important, not important, urgent, not urgent. So I'll have a look at what's going on for the week, roughly kind of map where those things out, things might change, but I kind of at least know that I can, you know, delegate these things that are not important, not urgent, um, focus. And I can't remember the name of the person who kind of developed this theory, but um, I remember one of the rare good bit of CPDs that I had, um, they talked about how, you know, eat that frog and how, you know, eating that mm. frog is the, the biggest thing that um, you need to do. Just, you know, sit down and tackle that, tick it off your list if that's what um, you want to do. But once you've kind of gotten past that point, then you can kind of feel successful. So I think that's where I'm at with that one. When we were sitting down before dinner, you, you said an answer that, that you thought was your idea of well-being and I'm just wondering why you didn't say it in the moment. The I thought it was an answer to another question, no. sorry. <laughs> oh, I should also be very grateful that... Um, you used the phrase domestic goddess. I did use the phrase. I am very lucky that <laughs> Shannon... I'm very lucky that Shannon's idea of well-being and relaxing is cooking food, um, which means that, um, you know, I can... I will always do the washing up. I'm just going to put that out there very quickly, straight away <laughs> before does. anyone comes in, uh, you know, criticizes me <laughs> for uh, you know, traditional gender roles and all of that kind of thing. That's not what this is. But I think that's fair to say you do enjoy cooking. Oh, absolutely. And that's how that is one way that you relax after work. Yeah, I come back from work generally because of the nature of my job at the moment, because I work in an office or I'm visiting schools for the first two or three days of the week. And then I'm teaching for the last two or three days of the week. I know that in that first part of the week, I can get home at a reasonable time. I can have a bath. We all know I love a bath, which is why I haven't been available for many of these pod chat recordings because I do enjoy an hour's bath most evenings. And, I, and then I know that I can cook dinner and it gives me a lot of joy knowing that I can have dinner ready for both of us because you do have probably a more stressful day to day job than me or certainly a busier job and a longer commute on some days. So that kind of gives me a bit of well-being. But I also think just like the opportunity to offload on each other. We're very fortunate in that all of us in this Zoom right now have teachers as partners. So we all understand each other's day-to-day -day struggles. And that I think makes it quite um, easy to be able to wind down. However, I guess it means that we also don't switch off as quickly as yeah. other people would. Um, but like you said, teaching is our hobby, education is our hobby, and that is what, at the moment, what we enjoy spending our time doing. But I also think it's just like having trusted people that you know that you can talk to and that you can un, um, like unload your, your day-to-day -day stresses. I know that I have two friends in particular, Amy and Emma, who will not mind getting a 20-minute voice note from me about my, my day if someone has annoyed me and I just need to get it out of my system that's a really, really valuable thing for me. So I think it's just making time for the things that are important to you and having outlets for your, your stresses. I mean, we've worked out quite recently that Kieran won't go above eight minutes. 
So um, on a voice note, no. That's why I don't voice note him with all of my daily stresses. That's why, yeah, Kira doesn't get those 20 minutes. <laughs> Loads of stuff there that makes sense to me. I um, I think I'm, I like to think I'm a fairly decent case study in this because I had the first two years in the profession which in which I looked after my well-being so poorly that I decided to leave the profession um, and then didn't, as it turns out, not fully, did a year as an HLTA, then kind of came back again determined to actually look after my well-being a little bit better having seen it modeled by some um, really good teachers I would say one of the big things for me that made a difference was making sure that I took at least one day a week I mean it's changed now that education in a similar way to you guys is is a hobby but before that I'm, it was really important to me to have at least one day a week where I just did not think about education stuff. I did not think about school. I tried to kind of protect my Sundays or my Saturdays. It was one or the other, just knowing that, no, today, those that doesn't invade what I'm going to be thinking about today. Sounds obvious, but getting into good sleep habits was a really big deal for me. Um, I found that when I was particularly stressed about my job, I'd get into negative cycles in that. I would want, I'd stay up later and later because I, you know, didn't want the next day to arrive. And obviously the later you go to bed, the more difficult it is to get up the following morning, et cetera, et cetera. And so that can spiral. So just getting into good regular sleep habits made a big difference to me. Little bits of exercise, making sure that I went for a walk every now and then um, was a big help to me. I think the other key thing was kind of deciding that having this little mantra that good enough was good enough. You know, it's so easy to get into a sense of perfectionism with anything you do at school. There's always this sense that you could do a bit more. You could make this thing a little bit better. You could plan this lesson in a little more detail. Recognizing where that line of good enough is and not going too far past it was uh, really important to me. It's funny you should mention like meal stuff. I think really taking care over what you eat and taking time if you've got it available if you're fortunate enough to be able to make that bit of time you know taking care of what you eat made a difference to me as well last couple taking days off when I was sick basically didn't do that except for I had swine flu in the first first or second year of teaching and had to take days off but other than that didn't matter how I felt I wasn't taking a day off and that was a problem over the longer term um and as part of that I made a little planning folder later on so that I knew if I needed a day off I wasn't going to have the stress of you know getting up that morning trying a set trying to send in stuff I just agreed with the head teacher that if I'm off for a day which is rare but if I'm off for a day just do direct the supply teacher towards this folder that I made during the summer holidays where there's a lot of one-off stuff that will last a day and one final one which is possibly a bit just one that's useful for me, but maybe for others. I found that when it came to just before bed, I'd struggle to get to sleep because I'd have like these thoughts about what was going to, I needed to do the following day, putting a little notepad beside the bed just so that I could, you know what, write it down. I'm not going to forget it. I don't need to worry about it. I know it's there helped with sleep patterns and sleep habits. So yeah, I'm not sure if any of that stuff is useful to anyone, but those were certainly important to being better at man maintaining my own sense of well-being. No, I, I think it's really helpful. You know, I mean, Neil, you're talking about if your hobby being education is problematic or is difficult. I think the only thing, you know, because we're the same, we spend lots of Saturdays at conferences, different places, spend a lot of time reading. The only thing I am worried about is how long we look at the screen for a day. And so I try and print out the papers that I read at nighttime or first thing in the morning so that, you know, my first coffee is maybe what, six o'clock. And then for half an hour, I'm not on social media. I'm actually reading something paper based and stuff like that there. But I, I don't see an issue with it because, you know, if it's something you want to do, then, you know, it, it doesn't feel like it's work. I mean, this podcast doesn't feel like it's work. Um, you know, despite the hours it takes, the only time it feels like work is when you can't get the intro to uh, an an interview because you know they, they don't happen with the person and then you just want it to be over and it's not but then um, yeah so i i don't see an issue with that slightly broadening our field of influence a little bit and almost thinking laterally as teachers supporting other teachers what 
do you do or what do you try to do for others to support their well-being? I think being someone who will sit and listen, I think trying to make people laugh, reminding people of what Neil and Chris both said about good enough is good enough, what's important, what's urgent, what's really not. We have an amazing ECT at the school that I'm working part-time in. And there was a Friday evening and she'd been, she'd had a cold for most of the week. And I kind of walked past her room and I saw she was still in there and she had a, a pile of English books next to her. And I said, what, what are you up to? And she said, oh, I just need to get these done. And I said, but do you need to? Like, wh- what's the worst that will happen? And she was like, do you think I can do them on Monday morning? And I was like, what do you think is going to happen over the weekend? Sometimes people just need that permission to go, it's okay to leave it. You don't have to sit until six o'clock every day looking through books. You don't have to have a PowerPoint ready the night before. You can, Sometimes we can do these things in the morning. Sometimes you don't need a PowerPoint. Sometimes the books don't need to have been marked. And that's okay. Obviously, you need systems in place and a reasonable leadership team for those things to be, you know, doable. But I think just being that that person who reminds people is quite important to me. Because I think for the first few years of my career, I was the person who was there seven till six every day. Then I moved to a school that stayed open till seven. So I was there seven till seven every day. And then you were looking at me like that's mad because that's not what I do now. I try and get home for a reasonable time. I try and get everything done as much as I can. I'll do a little bit of work at the weekend, but I need to be the person that says, no, you don't need to break your back because it's not going to be perfect. And just knowing that, you know, so I think, you know, Gareth Metcalf said it the other day, sometimes just turning up is a big well done for you. So that's okay. If that's where you're at, that's where you're at. But I think people need reminding. Um, And another thing that I thought was when it was introduced at my last school, I thought it was going to be this awful tokenistic forced well-being um, kind of strategy. And it was this idea of guardian angels where everyone who wanted to, you know, you could opt out, um, would have a person who would check in on them, uh, kind of write them a note. Eventually things got silly and people were buying chocolate bars and whatnot. And you, you ended up getting far too many extravagant nice presents we've got like three boxes of Maltesers in our cupboard still from my guardian angel from the summer term and I like I was one of the people at first that was like right we'll do it but I do think that like this kind of forced well-being is wrong however the joy it brought people was actually really special and the messages in our whatsapp group I'm still in that whatsapp group and I see I see them going oh thank you to my guardian angel for this this is really like brightened my day whether it's a like a, a, a croissant from Tesco that they've left on their desk or someone's printed out a meme and it's made someone laugh. And I, I was sent a message recently and just said, well, does anyone want to be my guardian angel? Because I don't get these things anymore. It's like, no, not one person is just specifically looking out for me and trying to do things to make me smile. And while it, I thought it was going to be a bit cringy and forced, it ended up being a really nice thing. And I think that's the kind of thing that, if I were in charge, I would try and bring in just to keep people smiling and build that kind of team um, feeling. I think what you say there about listening is a big one. A little strategy that someone in my, um, I think, third or fourth year of teaching used on me, which I thought was a bit odd at first, but was actually really valuable. I remember I went into their room just to basically complain about how my day had been and some something that had gone wrong, something I'd done not right. And they uh, said to me after I'd started, well, I, I spoke for a while and they said, just so you know, do you want me to just listen or do you want some advice? And I thought, well, that's an odd thing to ask. I said, well, actually, give me some advice. And I realized afterwards that, no, actually, this was just a circumstance where I just wanted, a, I just wanted someone to listen. And I didn't, I wasn't ready for advice. And actually, I think having that, as a kind of little protocol between you and another teacher can be a really nice thing because you don't realize quite how often when people are saying something about their day that how often they don't actually want advice on it they know what they did wrong they know what to do again next time they just want someone to listen 
And yet there are occasions where you do want a bit of advice. So having that as a kind of little structure behind, um, you know, the friendship that you might have and that kind of professional relationship that you have in schools can be a really useful thing, I think. Something else that I noticed was that where I really gelled with like a, a partner teacher was where we got to the point where we could recognize like the little jobs of teaching that you assume everyone hates, but actually it's just you that hates them and other people think they're okay and vice versa. I worked with a partner teacher who absolutely just despised marking SATs papers. So when we did like practice SATs, whatever, they just despised it. Personally, I can sit there for an hour, churn through a set of papers quite happily, bit of music on in the background, love it. But this partner teacher was also someone who didn't mind um, doing displays and photocopying. And it was like, oh, shall we trade these jobs? And we and it didn't always work out perfectly. But quite often there were these circumstances where we could trade a job. And, you know, the following year when you work with a partner teacher where you don't have that relationship built, you notice the difference. And it's only afterwards that you realize that oh, actually that was, a that was something that was really beneficial for my kind of just day to day enjoyment of the job so getting to know and not making assumptions about the uh, about what parts of the job the people around you do and don't enjoy is um, I think quite a useful thing to do so I think for me from a kind of school leader perspective it's just making sure that I put just really solid systems in place and that I'm kind of aware of what I'm um, asking staff to do and a lot of that is protecting staff where um i can i think um an interesting element is and this is we're a little one from entry school and so pretty much everyone is a subject lead at you know at some level and when you first become a subject lead it's you very quickly you know, really want to champion your subject as is and so what tends to happen is the the music lead has three ideas of things that they want to do to improve and the, the dt lead has three and then obviously we can't forget uh, about english and reading and maths that also have kind of three things and when when you try to i think one of the reasons why you know, teachers feel overwhelmed and kind of part of these stresses um is certainly you know senior leaders being able to kind of manage that school improvement aspect in a way that yes you get um you know, your school improves but you know you do it in a way that um you know doesn't sacrifice um you know people's evenings and weekends and so i think you know lloyd would be the person to talk about this because it's the way that he kind of sees these systems and structures is kind of far superior and anything that um you know i say here has probably been you know taken from Lloyd but the way he you know, maps out you know he has these like the waiting in the wings kind of subjects that like so the leaders can kind of have a couple of terms they um, you know prepare everything while the focus is on these and then we'll fade them um, you know some subjects out and bring some others whilst those that have just been faded out get the chance to kind of mm -hmm. you know reflect and think about well what happens next rather than um, you know just throwing the the kitchen sink um, obviously, sensible marking policy is a massive one. And when I say a sensible marking policy, you shouldn't have a marking policy. It should just be a nice little feedback policy because we know, you know writing ticks and well done, Johnny, you did a good job today. Uh, you know, it doesn't make a difference. And those are the kind of things that teachers um, you know, spend a lot of their time mm. doing. Um, a good curriculum so that teachers aren't kind of just having to try and put, you know, make things up as they go along. I said something wrong. You're just stealing my answers. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, buying in a scheme is absolutely fine if it's going to support teachers and the fact that they don't have to spend you know, a couple of hours on a Sunday, you know, researching the impacts of Roman Britain if, you know, the amount of lessons that must have been written about that mm. so vast, you know, it seems silly that you then ask, Know, this one teacher in this one school, usually part of a, an academy trust to replicate something that's being, um, you know, done hundreds of um, other times. I also kind of think as leaders, um, it's giving staff a bit of space. They won't agree with all your decisions that you make. And so you know, sometimes not going into the staff room so staff can have that, that time away from a leader to um, have that bit of a moan, you know, that's, you know, 
something that I think, you know, leaders should be prepared to do and just appreciate that that's part and parcel of it because say, you know, you might have a bit more knowledge about the reasons why something is the way it is that you can't tell uh, other members of staff, for example. But then equally, I think, you know, if you're, um, if you're so inclined, um, you know, invite colleagues down to the pub every once again. And I say, as a leader, you know, be that person to buy the first round, enjoy mm -hmm. their company, um, and then leave at about eight o'clock and let them enjoy the rest of the night whilst, you know, they undoubtedly continue to moan about decisions that you've made. Mm -hmm. But that's absolutely fine. Um, because say it's, you know, part of being a, a part leader. of what I think comes with uh, being in these leadership roles. I mean, not only did he steal your answer, Shannon, but he is so far removed from the classroom that he couldn't possibly imagine what it's like to be a teacher support another teacher. As you, as you guys are speaking, there's one thing that's coming to mind. And it's a question I've always asked myself, but I don't think I've ever said it out loud. Because you know the way as we get towards week six, week seven, or week 13, whenever we've got 14 week term, and we feel more exhausted than we've ever felt before. Do you think we're actually tired or because we're getting towards the end of term, we are very tired. Is it, is it psychosomatic? And if we say, for instance, we had 16 week term, would we feel the same sort of level of tiredness at week 12? Anyone ever thought about that before? Yeah, I've definitely thought about that before. And I've seen it in practice because I remember feeling just as tired at the end of like a four and a half week half term than I did at the end of that seven week half term. I think there's a sense that you do almost pace yourself. And so regardless, that last week is a drag. And not only that, I mean, maybe this is just me, but often at the end of a term, less so a half term, but at the end of a term, you're often doing bits and pieces that are no longer quite so tight into your school routines. So there might be an assembly here or there that's extra. There might be some kind of event that you need to do. And often these things where you are out of routine are more tiring than just being able to kind of stick in your day-to-day -day teaching routine. So I think that has an impact. But generally, I do think there is an element of the psychosomatic about it, mainly because I feel just as tired at the end of a, or, or did, feel just as tired at the end of a five week week half term as they did at the end of a kind of seven or occasionally seven and a half week half term though you know full disclosure not worked in a school since december just gone so uh, not feeling that in the same way but i like to think i'm still close enough to the classroom that i can empathize yeah, that's in that was going to be my question um given that say you two have kind of moved out of schools a little bit more um, you know, do you still have that sense of tiredness as you might do towards the end of a term, knowing that actually, you know, it's only either you're waiting for the next bank holiday or the next time you've kind of taken your um, bit of annual leave. So it's interesting to hear your thoughts on that one, Chris. I also think I'm, I'm guessing that, Kieran, because you've got two young children, you are still quite tied to terms kind of ruling your, your life. So you probably are still winding down to the end of terms, even if you're still working. It's just like that natural, that natural time, I guess. But I do think it is probably a lot in our heads. I, I would go as far as to say that Kieran's probably thinking the opposite. He's winding down towards <laughs> the end of like the Christmas holidays or the end of the summer holidays. And it's like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> They're back in school. I imagine it's the reverse. Every year I would think, oh, the summer holidays are almost here. The summer holidays are almost here. And then the summer holidays would come. I think, oh, I've got two kids. This isn't a break. I'm not on holiday. <laughs> this is actually worse because I'm not being paid for this. <laughs> like In terms that. of tiredness, obviously I, I do love spending time with my children. Um, I can't remember <laughs> what their names are, but I'm sure they're around here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, everything's so new and exciting that I haven't really stopped to think that. I haven't had a, I didn't have a half term. Did I, did I take, I took a day off. I took a Tuesday off um, during half term. And my first big holiday is going to come at Christmas. I'm going to take most of the, you know, the bits between and, the, and just, just before. Um, so I haven't really noticed anything, but it's a bit different because like I say, most of the things I'm doing are new and exciting and uh, getting, you're getting used to it. So yeah, so I don't, I, I certainly don't feel the same level of physical tiredness unless I'm traveling. Um, you know, cause I'd be getting up 
half five, six, being in school for half seven, having dropped the boys off. Then we come home, we do the, you know, the, the get bedtime routine and then it's eight o'clock before you're stopping. Whereas at least now, because a lot of my work is from home, we can split responsibilities a bit more readily, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll cook at least one day a week, I'll, like Neil, do the dishes every day a week, do the washing, that kind of thing. So we've almost redistributed the labor in the house. So yeah, so, it's, so but I think it'll probably take a year or two years before I realize the difference. But I certainly don't feel half as physically tired as I used to. So this time last year, I would have been on my knees, basically. Same for me. I mean, even though, so I work three days a week for ambition and then I end up working basically another three days on kind of consultancy bits and pieces, even though there are weeks now where I'll kind of get back up to the hours I used to do when I first started in primary teaching, I might occasionally do like a, you know, 55 or 60 hour week. It is nothing like a 55 hour or 60 hour week as a primary teacher, because Partly a lot of it has this sense of autonomy behind it that wasn't necessarily there in the same way. But more importantly, you're just, you haven't got that face-to-face -face, um, experience in this, uh, you know, there's online stuff and I do go to schools and this sort of thing, but actually working with children day in, day out, day out having 20 to 25 hours a week where you can't go to the toilet, <laughs> you know, 20 to 25 hours a week where if you feel sick enough that you think, oh, I might be unwell, not knowing whether you should leave the room or not, you know, because you've got a group of children to look after. There's nothing like that constant in your face stress. I think 45 hours, you know, if you're lucky enough to work 45 hours a week as a primary teacher, but 45 hours a week as a primary teacher to me was less tiring, less stressful than a 60 hour week in something that doesn't have that constant face-to-face -face interaction and it's only been a few months that i've been away but yeah i still have obviously nothing but admiration for people doing that job and i think that'll tie into some bits and pieces that i might say about school leadership but um happy to talk about that in a little while or now what do you reckon kieran yeah, I think we can definitely move there. I mean, you definitely should go to the toilet if you need to go to the toilet. You know, I don't care what's happening. Most classes have a teaching assistant. I know that there are teachers who wait until lunch or break time, and that's not good for your body. Um, you know, and it, it took the pandemic to show me, and talking to you, to show me that 45 hours is pretty reasonable, you know, and if you, and you get in diminished returns afterwards, because I would work, you know, before and after school in the past. And really, once we re started returning back, I thought, actually, no, I need to get a handle on this because, I'm, yeah, I I'm not doing anybody a favor. And I think 45 is is possible. Um, I think certain roles, I'm thinking about operational deputy head teachers in particular because you've got uh, lots of other stuff on top of your main job. But I think most teachers should be pitching. And the more I talk to you about it, Chris, the more I think we should. I think it's it's probably time to think about, well, how much can school leaders actually do to support their teachers? And the short answer to that is loads. There's loads that school leaders can do. The number one thing they can do, and this ties into what we've just been talking about, is be numerate with numbers within 100. Basically, no more, you know, numbers more or less than 45. Because if a teacher is consistently working more than, say, 45 hours a week, I think over the longer term, that's going to just drain them drain them and anything you think you're gaining from teachers when they're working past that amount of time as you say i think is entirely diminished returns you've got tired you've got tired stressed teachers who are more likely to want to leave the classroom or the school or the profession entirely so yeah first things first if you've got teachers who are doing their job in a way that you think is kind of effective and efficient and yet they're still out of necessity working more than 45 hours a week start to think what you can do to address that be absolutely ruthless with how you can cut workload i mean that's i know it's an obvious thing to say but that's where i'd begin um another thing um we, we, we've mentioned lloyd already his uh, the conversations i've had with him where he's talked about the extent to which they plan ahead the extent to which they make sure that you know if there is going to be 
a heavy um, like report writing or whatever it might be burden that this doesn't coincide with something else that's going to be a significant drain on teachers' time because it isn't just about whether the teachers are working on average, say, 45 or 50 hours a week. It's whether you somehow bombard teachers at given points with these weeks that require them to do 70 or 75 hours, which is just completely unmanageable for obvious reasons. Other than that, we get into kind of like little detailed stuff. I think the most I asked my partner this question when I found out like some of the questions from the podcast and she gave a load of stuff that I'm that I've embedded into what I'm going to say so I can sound a little bit more, you know, wise than I obviously am. But the first thing she said without hesitation was no empty promises. Like if you say you're going to do something about um, a particular class or a particular bit of behavior or some corridor routine or whatever it might be, you do it. As an SLT, do not make promises that you cannot keep. And I thought, I think that's good advice for teachers generally as well. But that one really jumped out at me. Thinking back to particularly when I was quite new to the profession and perhaps a little bit more nervous about these things, I found that senior leaders who constantly referenced Ofsted or, or, or called it oh, the big O as if, you know, that helps in some way. Oh, I'm not talking about Ofsted. I'm somehow using this weird label to describe them. But constant, constantly talking about Ofsted, constantly talking about that, I think, can stress teachers out. I mean, the interesting thing is it, you know, it stresses out teachers who, you know, arguably in terms of like an Ofsted outcome, don't have anywhere near as much skin in the game as say a head teacher might do. And yet, like I say, it still stresses them out. Why mention it? That's not why we're doing things. I mean, it, it's worth being aware of their existence, but constantly reference, referencing Ofsted, I don't think is a good idea. I think if you start a job as a senior leader, don't change stuff just because you want to like make your mark or because you want to put your stamp on things. Change things because they need changing and then do that slowly and cautiously for obvious reasons. Wherever possible, give teachers a sense of um, where they've earned it, a sense of trust, a sense, well, a sense of autonomy in particular. Work out the things that really matter to teachers. So particularly with particularly with regards to autonomy. Some teachers, for example, know loads about kids' books, love kids' books, and have really things that they're really passionate about and they really want to share with a class of children that they're building a relationship with. Now that can conflict with someone like me who might be building a reading curriculum that has very precise texts in it that I want all children to experience. But where there's give in that, where there's flexibility in that, find it. Because if this is something that particularly matters to this teacher, if you can find a bit of flexibility, find it. Which brings me on to the next point, which is know your teachers and know what matters to them. Know what their kind of the points, the like trigger points, if you will, the stuff that they really value and try where possible to be flexible with that stuff in particular. Be sensitive about illness. You know, if a teacher's off work, I remember from the first year of my te teaching career where I had swine flu, every day I was getting a phone call at three o'clock saying, are you going to be in tomorrow? I had no idea. Like I, I, I feel pretty bad right now, but I don't know how I'm going to feel in the morning. And eventually I buckled under the pressure and just said, yes, I'm going to be in tomorrow. I've been off for three days now. That does feel unreasonable. I, I, I'll, you know, I'll come in tomorrow. Went into school basically passed out in the classroom at the end of the day, needed to get a taxi home, leave my bike at school, all this sort of thing. And all because a senior leader hadn't been sensitive about the idea of, of illness, hadn't recognized that there are ways to deal with these things. I'll say one final thing, which is um, appreciation, you know, taking the time to appreciate the job that your teachers are doing seems like a pretty big deal to me it's it's often little stuff but it's little stuff that i think adds up to something consequential is there anything left for us <laughs> well you already <laughs> took some of mine earlier on uh I see you glancing over at my you notes that we I, I agree with chris in that there is so much that leaders can do it it's almost a joke that there's so much and that so many leaders aren't like when you think about we are in an echo chamber on Twitter. What is it? 5% of teachers are on there. 
when I think about and there's more on sort of edgy Facebook groups but there's you know there's still loads that don't access any kind of teacher social media because why should they but the the posts I see like I'm an admin for a, a year three and four teachers group on Facebook the post the anonymous post that I have to approve of people saying I'm an ECT I think I'm I think I'm done with teaching already you know I'm finding the workload too much uh, we're constantly stressed out about Ofsted. Oh, the demands are just too high. We're expected to stay at school until this time. It's just insane, particularly after when we've had COVID, where there's a period of time where we were told, do not come into school before eight o'clock and you need to leave at four o'clock because the cleaners have to come in and they can't be around you because that's where we were with COVID. And that stopped. And suddenly it's like, well, no, of course you need to stick around. Of course you need to get here early. And I remember... I went to start a new school and this is a school that was open seven till seven. And I said, well, oh, can I just, I like to get in early. What time do you open? And they said seven. And then I said, and close and they said seven. And I was like, oh, okay. That's, you know, an hour more than the school that I'd worked at before. And the head teacher said, uh, well, I'm not saying that I want my teachers to work those, those hours. And then said, oh, who am I kidding? Of course I want them to work the long hours. How is that helpful for someone in their third year of teaching to get that message? And I don't think that, and I know lead it, leaders have a really stressful job and from, you know, last year, you being a full-time deputy also teaching from talking to Lloyd and all the operational stuff that he has to juggle whilst you're still trying to be strategic. I know it's a really difficult job and I know that there are stresses that they are under, but there is no excuse for them to put that pressure onto their teachers like when Chris mentioned about Ofsted that's something I've got written down keep the stress away from teachers yes explain that it exists yes explain what the process might look like but that's it because it's 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 your job to safeguard your teachers and you have to be that umbrella like protecting them from the stuff that could come down on them and I don't I don't think that all leaders do a very good job of it other things I've got PPA at home that was a game changer for me when we were allowed to take our PPA at home, that happened during COVID. And suddenly I, I was a lot more productive because I wasn't being bothered. But also it meant that I could go and do like the food shopping at two o'clock and then come home and work until five if I wanted to. And the attitude suddenly was, I don't care what you do in your PPA. As long as, as, long as your work is done and your children are, are happy and learning, you'll have done the work at some point. And I quite liked that. I like that, that bit of autonomy, that bit of freedom. I know that some schools give their teachers an entire day a week for PPA. And I know that's not feasible for every school. However, wouldn't it be nice if it was? You know, if, if schools can get specialist teachers in and the class teacher doesn't have to be in the room for that hour, what a great use of time it would be for them to go and have additional planning or go and watch a colleague or do some reading around teaching. Again, when I was, must have been when I was an NQT or an NQT plus one, we had music teachers come in. And for the first kind of couple of weeks, we all left our classes and went off and got on off with different jobs because, you know, we had a lot to, to do. And then it was very much, no, no, you have to be in the room. You can't leave the room. So I'm sat at the back watching somebody else teach my class to a fairly decent standard. My class are getting on with it. And all I was doing was sitting there. And if someone had come in and seen me marking or sat with a laptop, it wouldn't have been acceptable. It just those tiny things where you think, actually, I'm an adult. I'm a professional. I can make a judgment. I agree with what Neil said about a curriculum. Don't make teachers reinvent the wheel. Planning from scratch takes an awful long time. And I don't know why it's so attractive to so many people. I think there are some teachers who like to plan from scratch, but I, I think once they, once they experience the opposite, they will realize that they've been spending so much time doing something that somebody's already done to a quite a high standard. I've, I've written down, be open about directed time. We were having a conversation before we sat down to record it about like the 1265 and, and whether or not we'd ever had a head teacher be open about it and what those directed hours actually went towards. And I know of one head teacher who at the start of the year prints off the directed hours across the year and says, this is what we're expecting you to do. Whether it's helping out at the Christmas fair until five o'clock on a Friday in December, or it's these are your kind of professional development hours. 
or you have to get in at this point and leave at this point just teachers knowing what is expected of them because I've been in the position where you know there's been like a PTA event on on a Friday and suddenly it's been explained to me that I'm expected to dismiss my class at six o'clock and that's not okay and whether or not that was directed time or not I'm not sure but the fact that there are teachers who might have had plans or might have just wanted to get home early on a Friday and suddenly that sort of stuff being dropped on them and I don't think that is uncommon I think there are teachers who are working, like Chris said, 60 hour weeks every single week and then being given additional things. And I don't think it's too much to ask for leaders to be transparent, open, realistic, and just to like protect their teachers from some of the stuff that really isn't necessary and really takes too much time. I also put um, free tea and coffee and refreshments. I find it baffling that there are still schools that ask teachers to chip in every term. I don't even drink tea and coffee. I do eat the biscuits. But the fact that there are, that, that there are teachers who have to pay a certain amount every term, it, it's just wild. Like Chris said, like we are face to face with people five and a half hours a day. We often don't take toilet breaks. If you're a, someone that needs a fresh air break, you're not getting those breaks. You know, you're not doing a lot for yourself during the school day. So I think it's not too much to ask for people to have free tea and coffee. Personally, I would also want like a cold water machine because <laughs> I've only worked in, in two schools where there was one and I'm really missing just having cold water all the time because that's, that's my vice during the day. And I just, I just think talk to your teachers ask them what they want there was a I think it was last year I made a really off the off the cuff comment about there not being a mirror in one of the staff toilets and my head teacher was like why don't you say something sooner like we'll get a mirror for that toilet because if that's going to change that's going to make you feel a bit better that you can just quickly check your hair or something or just look at yourself and make sure that you haven't got like bolognese down your top then which is likely for me because I'm a spiller but like that's a tiny thing that makes a difference and I like Chris said those tiny tiny things actually all add up to something quite big and that comes from the head teachers listening and paying attention to what's important to staff and I appreciate it's a difficult job and it's a stressful job and there is a lot for leader to, to juggle but ultimately the teachers should be your priority because they're the people who are stood there educating the children. And if, if, if we're not healthy, happy, comfortable, safe, then neither will our children be. And what a sad state of affairs that is. As a leader, invest in your teachers. Yet to me, I think a single teacher in the profession that doesn't want to get better um, at the job that they do and think as leaders you're in a position where unless you you know happen to stumble across edu twitter or various books whatever it might be you know, as a teacher you are that source of improvement so knowing that right now the mpqs are free um you know there should be a very good reason as to why you're not thinking about what staff am i going to send to these i just have you have you ever heard of the the head teacher saying oh i won't send them on, on that course because they'll go off and get a promotion somewhere else right and i think that's an important aspect like you need to as a leader you need to fully appreciate that your flock will leave you eventually um and that's fine that you should want them to leave as well prepared um for whatever future endeavor whether that you know still being in the classroom, still being involved in education, whatever it might be, that they can do that to the best of their ability and that, you know, you put um, courses and things in place that means that, you know, they can go and do that. I so say the MPQs are free, um, so there's no reason why, and they're pretty good right now, <laughs> far better than what they used to be. In terms of what we can do for, so as leaders, what we can do, as well as all of those things, it is like invest heavily in your staff and appreciate that it's you know thinking of as the system as a whole 
um, you know, it's never a wasted inv investment if, you know, they complete that NPQ and then six months later, they then go off to, to pastures new because you just know those kids down the road are going to get a decent deal. And hopefully, you know, that score down the road might also be in your map. So it's not like you're losing <laughs> that person. So you can, you know, still, you know, maintain those connections that you make through it as well. One final thing that jumps out on me, and it jumped out on me when Shannon said, protect your teachers. And it made me just immediately think about, well, what were the two or three like central causes of like stress as, a, as a, in my, in my time when I was a classroom teacher, one of them was behavior when behavior wasn't there. And then when I didn't feel supported with that from, um, the, you know, SLT, that was rare, but it happened. And that was a really significant source of stress. And the other was when, um, I had, um, a parent or, uh, who was particularly challenging for a number of reasons and the member of SLT that I'm thinking about now kind of also had like personal difficulties with this parent and so did everything in their power to make sure that I was kind of between them and that parent and I know that there are as Shannon said really difficult job to do but at the same time the role should be switched there it really should be the case that the person who is earning the big bucks and has the experience to deal with this sort of thing is the one that is at least taking some of the responsibility for supporting teachers with um, challenging conversations with parents where they um, turn up. I think the, the, the point about parents is really key. The behaviour point too, obviously. But, you know, we don't get into this job to be abused by parents, but sadly it does happen. And in, I remember in my NQT year, I had a parent who had been given a letter by someone in the school and it, they had no idea it was coming. And I didn't know the content of it, but I was the person who got the brunt of the anger. And so I was quite shaken because it was in my first term. And my head at the time, Max, who is on Twitter, wrote that parent a letter and said, you do not speak to our staff like that. You don't abuse and you don't come into the, the premises without permission. If you do it again, you'll be banned from the site. And that I suddenly was like, oh, she's really got my back. And I suddenly, I, like, I breathed out at the end of that day, like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm safe here. They're not, they're not actually going to let this parent like hurt me. And I know that sounds really bizarre, but as a kind of fresh teacher, that was a really scary time. But it was all sort of sorted by the end of the day because my head had acted on it and had the the guts to actually tell the, t the parent they were wrong rather than kind of pad to them and apologise and say, oh, I'm so sorry, this won't happen again and, and I'll deal with the staff because I've seen that happen as well. And it's, it, yeah, it, it, it plays a big part in, in wellbeing, I think, knowing that your head has your back when it comes to parents and students. So it sounds like there are a lot of ways to get this right, but also a lot of ways to not get it right as a school leader, you know, so hats off to anyone who is getting it right. And, uh, you know, I'm sure most people who listen to this, I'm mean, thinking of the leaders who we know and who we talk to, you know, they're, they're both their hearts and their minds are in the right place when it comes to this stuff. So, you know, I think, you know, we're talking, talk, Lloyd's caught a few times. He's not very good to look after himself, he looks after everybody else, but not himself. So maybe, if he's listening to this on a Monday morning and he's lining up a three, four minute voice note, maybe think again, Lloyd, and just go and look after yourself. Have that, uh, that McDonald's coffee that you're always, uh, that you're always really pleased to have. <laughs> Let's imagine that we have total control of the education system. And obviously we, we do, but we have the pretense that other people are in charge. You know, that's how shadowy organizations work. Um, if you could change one thing on a system-wide level to try and improve the well-being of those working in schools, what would it be? We'll start with you this time, Neil. What would it be? I just think the greatest commodity I think you can give a teacher is time. And so I think on that system level, somehow, I'm not sure how it would work, but I think art, music, as many of those procedural subjects, languages, computing, 
in my mind, there's, you know, there's, there is a factory that just, you know, pumps these teachers out and there's <laughs> enough of them for every school, which means that, you know, teachers, if they want to, don't have to teach those subjects because for some people that would be, you know, the worst thing in the world. That's fine. I'll find something else to, you know, as a leader, I'll cover your maths quite happily. If you, <laughs> if you want to, you know, take your maths lesson out, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I think really kind of, pie in the sky thinking obviously is just making sure that schools that teachers have that time I think the more realistic could happen tomorrow is to kind of just look at the primary national curriculum and think actually if kids aren't doing languages and DT is that really the end of the world on a formal level like you know Ofsted coming in and being like well what are you expecting you know how are you expecting kids to use a glue gun at the age of like year five and how what's what is the progression in sticking and then from you know three four five and six um obviously i'm being a bit harsh to dt but you know what i mean um kids should have the experience of you know junk modeling absolutely but you know let's not kid ourselves and think that i think you know planning these granular small step curriculums for you know progression in some of these subjects actually has the will have the impact that Ofsted think it will. Love that. Sticking with the theme of Ofsted then, um, I know it's part of what they are supposed to do already, but I'd like to see Ofsted really take workload seriously, like really take it seriously. And I mean, so of, like first and foremost, the priority when they go into any school is of course safeguarding. That should always be like number one, nothing's going to touch that. Below that at the moment, you very much get the sense there's then curriculum, and then there's a big old gap and there's everything else. I think that in terms of the way that the, the whole education system works over the longer term, I think teacher workload and making sure that that's manageable is as high a priority as curriculum. And I don't say that lightly. I do think that when we're looking at a profession that's struggling for teachers, when we're looking at a profession where far too many of our teachers kind of want to leave the classroom in some form, I think making sure that workload is high on the agenda when Ofsted are looking at how good a job a school is doing I think that's a really important thing that they could do and that's probably the most obvious kind of system-wide change I would recommend. I think both are very good points um I agree that that should be a huge line of inquiry when Ofsted go in they should be asking about workload and I think also like, how are you in investing in your staff? How are you developing them? How are you making sure that they feel valued and, you know, they're feeling like they're being developed. However, that's not what I wrote down. I think I agree with time being a huge commodity. And I think I'm not saying it's going to change the profession completely, but I do think that if teachers had more PPA, they would just feel a little bit more relaxed. They're still going to be stresses. They're still going to be pressures. But um, I look at PPA and I think most teachers probably don't get 10%. Lots of teachers I know get two hours in an afternoon, which isn't 10% of contact time. That's just not enough, is it? It's not enough to plan the, the number of, of lessons that we teach in a week. And I know that, you know, the pay and conditions document will say that we that we're expected to do work beyond the directed time that, that to get the job done. But I think if we had a, a 20% PPA, then that would just make life a lot easier. And that's when, you know, those subjects could be taken by specialists, your PE, your music, your computing. I like teaching MFL, so I won't, I won't say that one. But that I think would be like a just a way of making them feel like they just had a bit more breathing space and and if if it was an entire day they wouldn't have to be in the building they wouldn't have to get called out because one of their their kids is misbehaving or because the head wants to have a five minute chat you know i i think that that is a big factor in um ppa not being super productive so i think that's what i would do if not something to do with the curriculum but i've said ppa now nice and I think they're all manageable changes as well. You know, they're not totally beyond the realms of possibility. I'd like to see 
within term holidays acceptable on a national level? You know, I'm not talking two weeks in the middle of term, but, you know, a Friday and a Monday here or there. Is that going to be the end of the world? You know, considering there are lots of places where the school production for Christmas takes a month and a half, you know, that's more time wasted than, you know, on a weekend. And and you can do things with people in other sectors can do. You know, I think that would make a big difference knowing that we had that flexibility. We didn't need to pay over the odds for holidays, perhaps even making, giving teachers some sort of discount on holidays so that it was actually cheaper for them to go in August somewhere than uh, the rest of the year. I don't know. But see, I've just taken your very sensible answers and made things that I personally would like. <laughs> I'm here for it. Just we saying, can have a city break. Yeah, my last school um, allocated three days across the year that you could just mm. take no um, no questions. Uh, there were a few stipulations like it can't be like the last day or the first day of term, etc. Um, you couldn't roll them over, so use them all in like the summer term. You had to take it one per term, and obviously, you know do the right thing then buy your SLT and you know don't just say oh I want tomorrow off as my <laughs> well-being day you know book it well in advance you know be fair um it worked mm. <laughs> um you know there's no reason why it couldn't happen you say with enough preparation and planning that you know, teachers can then take a random day in December to get the Christmas shopping done so they don't have to rush and worry about doing that on a weekend for example so or, well, I, I've always worked in schools that offer a Christmas shopping day. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a delight. I've never used it for Christmas shopping. You no, do we do time. our Christmas shopping in August. I mean, anybody who <gasps> isn't, isn't uh, very well prepared, really. I'm not thinking about Christmas until <laughs> December hits. I was working with a colleague today who said she does it in the January sales just after the Christmas. Oh, that's nice. We get our decorations Stop in the January <laughs> sales. So like the, the, because everything's really, you know, they don't want it anymore, do they? You know, yeah. so get your decorations, get, you get really nice stuff. Ah, good thinking. No nice decorations. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I personally wouldn't have a tree if uh, I was given a choice, so. <laughs> no, no, listen, trees are, Christmas trees are wonderful. I mean, it's been wonderful talking to you guys. I know that for our Kofi subscribers, we're going to continue the conversation. We're going to look back on, 100 episodes of Thinking Deep of Primary Education. This won't be the last time we come to Wellbeing. Um, you know, as usual, we've only really scratched the surface. All I have to do is say thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks again. And to everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening.